Hello everyone, welcome to the program. This is Thunder Politics, live on Channel's television. I'm Sean Okimbaloye in Abuja. Happy Easter to you all. Whatever you may be watching tonight, we shall be exploring the intersections of faith, governance, and community in our program. And we're looking at our nation and the next step. Tonight, we shall be... Uh, speaking with Bishop Matthew Kuka on one hand, and also we shall also be speaking with the Honorable Minister for Works, Engineer Dave Umai. Tonight seems to be a double barrel kind of package for you. It's an Easter Sunday. What else can we do than to bring you a very well-packed program? Tonight, we're speaking first with the former governor of Ebony State and the Minister of Works, Mr. Dave Umai, on the infrastructure agenda of the Tinobu government and recent development in that sector in our nation. Mr. Dave Umai is live for us virtually from his hometown in Ebony State. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for joining us tonight on the program. Okay, thank you very much. And happy Easter to you and happy Easter to Nigeria. Thank you so much. Happy Easter to you too. Uh, I was almost saying Pastor Dave Umai, but because I'm speaking to you uh, as uh, as minister, let's leave it at uh, the minister of works. <laughs> All right, let's begin our conversation tonight. Uh, although we're uh, we're in the Easter mode, uh, but there are some those who are already reacting to some of the infrastructure uh, stories that we are hearing. First is the Lagos Calabar Coastal Expressway. Uh, that uh, has brought some conversation up as to the significance and the benefits of that kind of road. How far uh, uh, has work gone? This is about 700 kilometers of road, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah. So what, what, what are you asking specifically? How far is the extent of work? I know that the committees from the House and the Senate, they, they went on uh, a tour with you on that project. What update can you give us? What is the extent of work? Well, um, the, the road, like you rightly said, is 700 kilometer on that is one, and it's uh, Lagos uh, down to uh, Calabar, uh, coastal road. Uh, the road is uh, quite a very unique one in the entire Africa. The road is uh, of 10 lanes, five lanes on uh, either side and the middle, we have the five meter you know, provision for you know, rail line. And uh, so the rail line and this road, uh, uh, we intend to complete it within eight years of Mr. President's administration. You ask the importance of this road. The importance of this road, uh, it is difficult to explain it uh, just in one place. But this road is passing from uh, Lagos through uh, nine states, the coastal states, you know, down to uh, Cross River. And this is phase one. The phase two is to link up with the uh, African Trans Ara route from Ogoja, you know, down to Cameroon. Uh, the phase two is to link up with uh, the Badagri Sokoto route uh, that I intend to procure uh, under the new infrastructure, the new job of Mr. President. So you can see that the entire country uh, is, will be tied together under this kind of uh, super highway. But I can say it's the first of its kind in Africa. And so what are the benefits? The benefits are enormous. You know, apart from the fact that uh, you can do from uh, Lagos down to uh, Cross River within seven hours, seven hours, in a moderate of 100 kilometers per hour, you also have a rail line. Then Mr. President directed for, to, uh, uh, to have a quick return on investment that we should liaise with states, this coastal states, the nine coastal states, and procure uh, land along the corridor of this uh, project so that we can develop you know, infrastructure like tourism, you know, factories, industries, estates, and so on and so forth. And so you can see that in each state it is passing, there will be a linkage to the existing uh, you know, roads in each of the states. So it's going to tie the entire country together. Uh, even the Lagos Abuja Super Highway that we intend to do Lagos Abuja when that is done within five hours, 
you can see that that is also tied together. So this road, people view it as just, uh, you know, uh, tying the coastal states together. No, it's tying the entire country together. Let me, let me begin by asking, when you say eight years of this administration, uh, there are those who will say uh, they only voted for President Tunubu for an initial four years. And the president has also said, look, if, uh, if any politicians perform, uh, they should re vote them in or out. So when you say eight years of this uh, president, one will wonder that it's only four years that he bargained for and is renewable. So uh, that's on one hand. But what is going to be interesting is to know that I know you are an advocate of the concrete technology. So, and Costa, for a lot of Nigerians, uh, for, for the benefit of those who are not familiar with this kind of project, Costa means that it's along the water uh, bodies. So it's, it's more or less going to be a different kind of construction. Give us an understanding of how much this will cost and whether or not you are using the cement technology. Uh, Jim, let, let me first tell you that uh, um, you call me a pastor. I'm also a prophet, and uh, um, you must know that uh, the coming on board of Mr. President is divine. And uh, when God starts a thing, he completes it. So I strongly believe, and uh, I'm persuaded to let you know that God told me that this administration will last eight years. And uh, because uh, this administration is born of God, and you can see the miracles that uh, uh, Mr. President is doing through the inspiration of God Almighty who brought him to right all the wrongs and reset this country. So we take him back this country, we will give him back this country to Nigerians, and that's simply what Mr. President has come to do. And so we are just there to support him. Uh, the uh, question you're asking about the, the, the concrete technology, I'm very happy that the National Assembly members, you know, there were uh, some of them very critical of, uh, you know, the, 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 the technology of uh, concrete. And uh, I took them to Port High Tech. And for me, High Tech has come to be the number one, you know, construction company in Nigeria. And uh, you can take me on that, you know, we, we can debate it and I will prove it. If you go to the... Uh, Even above the lights of Julius Baja. The likes of uh, um, Julius Baja and the rest. I tell, I mean, what gives you what? Uh, uh, Shew, I'm a you know a fellow of Nigeria Center of Engineers. Uh, I'm uh, the engineering is uh, part of me. I'm part of me, and uh, I've been on the saddle, you know, uh, knowing who is doing what. I reckon the company that will do a road and it will not fail within 15, 20, 30, 50 years, and that's simply what. Uh, you know, um, high tech is doing with uh, Dangote on task credits. And so this one, having performed, you know, Lagos, we went through there. The National Assembly members, they saw it. We went into the deep sea port, all done on concrete reinforcement. In fact, they say we were making decking, you know, on top of roads. So the concrete road technology has come to stay. And let me say that who started all this concrete thing is Mr. President. When you go to VI, where he was governor, you can see that. All the roads in VI, and even up to today, they were all paved with uh, interlocking ties. It's a kind of concrete technology. And so I drew my inspiration from him, and he has given me all the support to continue to insist that when a road is done, it should be able to last for 50 years. Now, tell me, apart from high tech, who else has done a road in this country and it can last for 50 years? So the, the, the National Assembly members are very, very excited about this coastal road about the use of concrete to do our roads. They went through the roads that been done by ITEC and they could not see one single, single crack or through. But you will recall, Shehu, that you know, over the years, this uh, Papa Ushuri has defined all kind of construction methods and solutions. But today, you, we are witnesses to you know, a very wonderful concrete pavement that we also have. And you go to deep sea port, you will see the same thing. And so they have started the coastal road, and uh, people were criticizing me and say I left the likes of this and that and this. I said, look, I'm an engineer. I'm not a historian or a literature person. You know, I understand engineering. I love engineering. I love, you know, constructing roads. And so they said, you said high tech at done 1.3 kilometers something. As I talk to you, they have done over five kilometers 
of St. Philip. They have started the real reinforced concrete works. I was amazed. They said 36 months that are going to beat us hands down. I will be surprised if that road is not done. The first section of this one is not done within uh, 24 months. So, so uh, uh, Minister, from, from what section to what section will be ready at the first phase? From Lagos to where? Okay. Now, the, 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 we have two phases of the project. The first phase is Lagos to uh, uh, Calabar, 700 kilometers. And then you have the phase two, which is to S4. We call it S4. Uh, like I said to you, I intend to procure uh, Lagos, uh, Badagri to Sokoto, and then link up this uh, coastal road to that. And then, of course, the existing uh, trans sahara African trade route that is taking us to Cameroon is existing. That's at Oguja axis. So this is phase two. Now, on that phase one, that is going to be procured in many sections. Now, the first section is section one, which are Hamad Velo way to deep sea ports, and it's 47.47 kilometers. And I'm sure you're going to ask me the cost. The cost is 1.067 trillion. And uh, people who do not understand figures may tend to start, uh, you know, bothering themselves about uh, 1.067 trillion. If you want to know, you can divide this 1.67 trillion, divide it by 10 lanes, and divide it by 47.47 uh, kilometers. And then you will see how much is done per kilometer and compare it with what has been in existence, even when the economy was booming. And uh, uh, high tech did not uh, accept it just like that. We debated it, we argued, we quarreled. You know, how can you give us you know, a cause that was uh, given you know, five years ago uh, to some of the uh, contractors. And uh, I insisted that this is not, you know, I didn't exist in that time, that I exist now, and I only do what is fair and just in line with the economic realities of uh, the renewed but, but the question so, is, uh, Minister, that is if that tallies with the global standard and the World Bank standard of construction of a kilometer of road, does that meet up with that standard, the costing? The, 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 you, you don't have uh, any uh, standard cost per kilometer, you know, uh, that they say this is the cost. You know, I set the cost, you know, in line with economic realities. I know what the cost of cement is. I know what Y20 road costs. I know what Y16 costs. I know what sampling costs per meter cubed. I know what the cement sand, you know, treatment costs. I put all these costs together, and that is my cost. And this cost is unique to... Uh, Nigeria is unique to that particular project. But what I was trying to say is that they were similar projects. I don't want to mention companies and projects that are similar in nature, like this coastal road, which cost five years ago, uh, uh, you know, remain, you know, even higher than this. And uh, even there are some roads going on uh, before now that the cost is even higher than this coastal road. Don't forget that the coastal road construction is quite a very unique uh, uh, project. Uh, like this one has over 20 bridges, but we move the bridges of section one to section two. We are presently procuring section two, and section two is running from uh, deep sea ports, uh, 55.5 kilometers from deep sea ports uh, down to the boundary between uh, Ugun and Ondo, and that is where section two stops. And section three is being procured now. We are designing and redesigning, and uh, that is starting from the end of the project, and that's cross river. And that's what we're doing. We are going to do into uh, section four, five, six, and uh, all these sections will be going on all at the same time. Anyone we procure will be, you know, uh, engaged independent of the other one. So, so are the funds readily available now? Do you have the funds? Have you paid ITEC? Yes, I've paid ITEC, as I should pay them. So the first are, section, are, are, you, are you going to okay. construct the rail line alongside simultaneously with the construction of the road? Or the rail will come after the construction of the road? You know, uh, uh, Shewa must come in, Mr. President. Uh, he has shown every bit of his administration to be an infrastructure person. He's shown to be uh, an accountant. Is shown to be a divine president. He has put up what no man ever thought about, and that's the renewable infrastructure 
uh, uh, you know, uh, fund. And um, because when you want to even borrow money, and when people ask me uh, how with this project, I said, look, this project, I'll use the engineering uh, technology that it has a self leasing you know, mechanism. Uh, in hydraulics engineering, we call it self leasing velocity, which means that it has the capacity to pay, you know, for uh, uh, the cost of uh, the project. There are some roads that will not be able to pay for the cost of construction even in 50 years. And that's where the social security comes in. But this one is an investment, and um, through this uh, renewable infrastructure uh, uh, mechanism, I believe that uh, the investors are going to have very serious. Uh, Confidence, because sometimes you want to borrow money to invest, they ask you to pay certain counterpart funding. And uh, we cannot have it either through appropriation or any other mechanism. But through this mechanism that Mr. President Johnny has brought out, and I commend him very highly, and all those who work with him, like the Minister for Finance, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the electric brain, you know, Zach, you know, the FRI chairman, uh, the, uh, uh, the Minister for Budget, uh, the uh, CBN governor, ESCC, and so on and so forth. So I commend them. They put this thing together. I, I wasn't part of it, but I'm going to be part of the implementation to ensure that it's the reality. So we are going to see hope. We are going to see, you know, uh, the construction of the rail line going alongside with the construction of uh, this road, you know, all at the same time through this mechanism. Right. I'm very confident about that. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that, um, you know, it is God that uh, review that to Mr. President. All right. Uh, you, you somewhat are answering uh, a few questions that I plan to uh, ask you uh, with answering some of the questions. But let's, let's go on a, on a short break. And when I mean, we come back, there are I all mean, the projects that are of importance. You have said there are two bridges that are unhealthy in Lagos. Should Lagosians be weary of these bridges? We come back and talk about that. And some of those projects that could be des uh, defined as Bola Tinubu's legacy project, and you tell us more about them after this break, everyone. Join us again. With us on this Easter Sunday, the Minister of Works, uh, Dave Uma, he has been speaking with us. Let's get back to the conversation, Honorable Minister. It does look like um, the Lagos Calabar Coastal Expressway is getting so much attention and there's so much to talk about. Eh? I, I want to quickly move away from it because. If I stay on it, we'll spend the whole day talking about it. But uh, when you say that uh, it will bring some immediate benefit, uh, will it be told? Or how does the federal government think uh, some revenue will be generated from it? Oh, the true tolling and the true the engagement of the, uh, the uh, infrastructure that will be developed along uh, the corridors on that PPP. So uh, a lot of uh, you know, land will be made available for investors. And they come in, you know, like I told you, tourism, you have industries, you have factories, you have, uh, you know, estates, and so many other types of infrastructure will develop along this corridor. It's quite unique, and I think it's important in Africa. Uh, so there are a lot of benefits, and I'm going to be engaging uh, to discuss, you know, these benefits, to discuss uh, the progress uh, being made uh, along the line. It's uh, a whole year, eight year project. All right. It's Quickly, let right. me ask you, there are those so, who have also raised eyebrows about some of the projects being uh, undertaken by this government. Uh, those who think uh, mo some of these projects are concentrated to the southern part of Nigeria. But you have also come out to say there is a spread. Uh, in all of this spread, if you can just highlight and sum in summary, give us where these uh, legacy projects are going to be in terms of road construction in the six geopolitical zones. Can you give us an uh, understanding of that? So let me first, uh, you know, say this. Uh, we must, as, uh, you know, people as a nation, begin to think about, uh, you know, national interest. And that's what Mr. President demonstrated. And that's what I'm following suit. When we came on board, we have this uh, NMPC tax credit, uh, and the total cost today is about 5.3 trillion. Of course, the spread. The spread is that you have the North Central, they have about 27% of it, North Central. You have uh, the uh, South, South, 27%. You have the Northwest, 14%. Uh, I can't remember others, but the least is Southeast, 3%, and Southwest, 4%. 
And people put up an argument. I said, look, you have a PIDF project. PIDF project is uh, Abuja Kano. Abuja Kano is 753 kilometers. Uh, if you stretch it to one lane, but if it is double lane, it's uh, 375 kilometers. Uh, it's been done by Gilbert Beja of late. They requested for 1.5 trillion review of the project. Uh, we are still battling on that. But the good thing is that Mr. President, uh, when we came on board, he didn't look at the spread, whether it is rightly done or wrongly done. He asked me to go ahead and review all the project and they bring it to completion. So, and the, what was uh, paid as at the time we assumed of, it was only 500 billion, which means that we have 4.8 you know, trillion. And uh, if you talk about spreads, you will find out that the spread was not there. But is there any reason behind that? And the NPC had to procure this, uh, you know, uh, projects along the line of uh, their business, you know, which are, what are those rules that would assist them to transport their petroleum product? Uh, it may not be 100% correct, but leadership is about, you know, uh, uh, correcting what is not uh, correct, and that's by building more rules. And we inherited 2,600 projects. And when people tell me that I have one trillion uh, budget, I said to the National Assembly, you have a palliative budget in Ministry of Works, because not up to 10 projects has 10 billion appropriated to it. And all the envelope I got, we had to use it to keep all the projects we inherited alive, so that when we find money, then we'll be able to you know, go ahead with these projects. That is number one. So number two, uh, you look at Abuja Kano uh, you know, projects, uh, we still have about 280 kilometers of the roads to be completed. And uh, Mr. President has told me that you must complete this project within 12 to 14 months. That's a matching order he gave to me. You look at Abuja Lokoja, that's the first project I visited. And Abuja Lok uh, uh, Kaduna was this, the second project I visited when I assumed office. So uh, uh, I think Mr. President, and I'm following suit, is looking at the entire country as one. Because one road connects to the other, especially the trunk A roads. Trunk A roads get from one point of the region and they continues to the other points of the region. So the interest of Mr. President is how to interconnect all the states and all the regions together. And it doesn't matter which project. But at the same time, there is a very good spread. You look at uh, you know, uh, Abuja Kano that we are doing everything to complete. And I'm going to complete some of those uh, sections of the road in concrete, you know, and no matter what anybody does, it's going to be done. Uh, right. So that when you see the on uh, 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 you ask me for legacy projects of the president. You've not even asked me. I've not even said anything. You know, <laughs> you have the Buruku. Uh, <laughs> but I'm telling you, projects are going on all over the country. And uh, some people are criticizing me, saying, look, you're from Southeast. I'm not, uh, you know, minister of Southeast, but definitely. Mm -hmm. Southeast is in the record now, you know, and like the two bridges that uh, collapses, uh, you know, um, in Ugu Portacourt. Immediately, Mr. President said to go and they procure it. It's all going now. So there are quite a lot of, I think this uh, uh, present administration has honestly remembered Southeast, you know, but I'm not concentrating in Southeast alone. I am doing that which we inherited, and it doesn't matter where it is located. Mr. President said, and we complete all the projects. All right, so the is it? Yeah. Is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. It's Minister, fantastic it is in because... Lagos that I would love for us to anchor. Uh, and you have mentioned that there are issues with some bridges in Lagos. Two of them you highlighted. Uh, the Todd Milan Bridge, I'm, uh, I'm understanding now, with the smoothness of the road, one has to be very careful. And those who are saying maybe there's need to actually put some. Uh, Kind of caution in terms of bombs and all other view. When is it going to be open? And what are you doing from some of these bridges you say in Lagos that are problematic, unhealthy? Yeah, um, it's not just uh, Lagos uh, bridges that are you know needed to be checked. You know, I've checked the Mutala Mohammed Bridge in uh, Kogi State, and uh, we are arresting the uh, the defects. You know, underwater defects, we are working on that and the expansion just. But let me mention critically two uh, bridges in Lagos that uh, we have uh, examined and that we need to pay good attention. And that's the Terminal Bridge, 11.8 kilometers by eight lanes. And it's very critical. And when you talk about 
the total rehabilitation of the bridge. You talk about the deck. Mr. President has released money, and I can say that 99.9% .9 of the project is done. But what is uh, to be done is additional work, which is we are putting a, a solar light. We are replacing the generator lights to solar light. We are putting CCTV both on top of the bridge and under the bridge. Because the president told me that part of the problem we're having under the bridge is people that are doing illegal mining of the sand. And I agree with him, and I've seen it. They even go as far as, you know, destroying the concrete of uh, the pie caps, you know, uh, inside the water to anchor their small, small boats. And then, in fact, the National Assembly people saw it. So now, the, the top of the deck is uh, completed. Within the next uh, seven days, we're done with the lane marking. And uh, even if we are not done with the lane marking, I will direct that the road be open, the bridge be open, and then we can uh, close, you know, maybe one or two Sundays and complete that. Uh, the, 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 the bridge works uh, in terms of the CCTV and the solar light will not disturb traffic. Now, when you go under the water, you know, under the deck, you will have three elements, you know, that needed rehabilitation. And that is the pier. The pier is what we call literally columns. And that is what is carrying the deck. And now you have, uh, you know, the, the, the pie cap. The pie cap is what aggregates all the pies together and then now takes on the column or the pier, as you may call it. And so these two elements are in critical condition. And we have looked at it, we have, uh, you know, examined it. I went with the coordinating minister of the economy and he saw the urgency of it. And so we spoke with Mr. President and he gave us some funding, uh, even though it's 30% of the funds that were required. So the, uh, the Tom Lam Bridge, part of it was built by Deja. So I right. give it to them at 21 billion so that they can reach yes. And uh, this, but there is an aspect you need to know. And that is what is going on inside the water. And that's what we are, you know, uh, uh, you know, inspecting right now with Beja and I come from uh, Italy. And uh, when we are done, we let the public know All that right. we are on top of the whole thing, mm. not the same thing with the Qatar bridge. All right. Uh, Honorable Minister for Works, please, when next you come to Abuja after the Easter break, I will crave your indulgence to please, let's sit down. There's so much more on some of these projects that I will pra practically want, want us to walk through with Nigerians so that we can know exactly what uh, this government is up to in terms of works. Thank you so much indeed for your time. I appreciate it. And I allow you to go enjoy your Easter yes. celebration. Yes. 330 uh, palliative projects ongoing on, you know, costing about 300 billion, which the president has released money all across the country. There's so much to talk about, about please, infrastructure development. Please, when you, when you come back on. to Abuja, uh, if, if you are clever in Dodgers, please come into the studio and let's have a lengthier conversation on this. Thank you so much indeed for your time. Uh, Pastor thank Engineer you, boy, Dave you. Umayi, Minister of Works, thank you so much indeed. <laughs> We we'll take a break, everyone. And when we return, I'll be joined by a most reverend Matthew Kuka. He's a bishop of the Catholic Church of the Dos Tokoto Diocese. We're speaking about the state of the nation. It's a voice of conscience and a wisdom in a turbulent world. We'll be speaking with us about Nigeria and the way forward. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. Everyone, I'm now being joined from Sokoto virtually by the Bishop of uh, the Catholic Church, D Sokoto Diocese, uh, the most reverend uh, Hudson Matthew Kuka, uh, who in his uh, Easter message gave some profound uh, message on the way to go, the essence of Easter. Bishop Kuka sheds light on the path towards healing, offering insight crucial for our collective journey towards a more just and harmonious society. Most Reverend Dr. Matthew Kuka is the Bishop of the Catholic Church, Sokoto Diocese. He's joining me live from Sokoto. Thank you so much, Bishop, for joining us. Uh, happy Easter to you. And perhaps a way to begin is to quickly get your view on the essence of Easter. What does this mean generally for Christians and for the world generally? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Sheol, and happy Easter to you. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, it was good listening to your previous guest, uh, Engineer Umahi, our Minister for Works. I'm happy to hear about the progress being made. I didn't know he had become a pastor because the last time we talked, I thought he was on his way to becoming a Catholic. 
But anyway, um, let me come back to the essence of your question. Look, I mean, Easter, because these things happen every year, we never seem to appreciate the fact that there is something fresh, something new for us to think about. And uh, it's not just about us as Christians. There is an opportunity for us to pause for a moment and see how uh, Jesus Christ, his mission on earth, and how his mission on earth was about bringing light uh, to a dark world, and how his resurrection was an, an affirmation of the things that prophets had spoken about for hundreds of years before his coming. And I think this is really what sets Christianity apart. You know, I don't mean any disrespect, but this is why Christianity is what it is. And it's important that Christians understand, you know, that uh, before Jesus came, uh, prophets uh, over time had predicted his coming. And also, we can even say we had an address and we almost had a telephone number too because we were told where he would be born. We were told um, how his birth was going to take place by a virgin. And then we also were told about his death. And of course, the good thing is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ ticked all the boxes right. So it is important for Christians to understand that Jesus wasn't just a good man. Jesus wasn't just a teacher. And contrary to what some non-Christians tend to say, Jesus was not a prophet. Jesus was the subject and the object of prophecy. He was the fulfillment of prophecy. And his resurrection was a validation of that point. So it just gives us an assurance and an opportunity to reflect on the fact that the promises that God makes are promises that God always keeps. All right. I, I can see a nexus between your, what your, the essence, as we captured it tonight, of uh, the essence of Easter and your Easter message, which you uh, put a healing as a thematic preoccupation. And you, there is a nexus of that onto how it also extends to our nation. Why do you think we need healing? Well, look, this is a broken nation, a severely broken nation, a severely fractured nation. The evidence is before all of us. Uh, what we have been doing in the name of politics is just picking up the pieces. The entire country is, is, is littered, you know, with broken dreams, broken hopes, promises made and promises never fulfilled. Uh, indeed, the over 300 or 500 or maybe half, more than half a million abandoned projects that littered this country. It's a testament, you know, to the brokenness of our country. Um, the very fact that hundreds of Nigerian citizens are still in captivity uh, is evidence of the brokenness of our society. The evidence that the country is actually, in the last 10 or more years, has become almost a, gra a graveyard of sorts. And that we're burying people in their hundreds, and we're not in a war. Uh, we don't need to look any further to explain how broken our country has been. And to say this is not to ascribe blame to an individual or to a particular government, is that we need to return to the scene of the crime to see the, the range of opportunities that we miss. And that's why I mentioned in my message that when we say the things we say, we're not saying it to attack a government. And from where I stand, I have for the last 40 years paid quite a lot of attention to thinking and reflecting about the history, the progress, the culture, and where Nigeria should be going. So my, my messages are never really flippant. And I don't beg people to agree with me. I allow for the fact that many people will find areas of disagreement with the things I say. But we cannot quarrel with the fact that ours is a nation that desperately is in need of healing. And I think the right time is now, especially from the kind of things we are hearing that government is trying to do. A nation needs to heal, you know, before we can enjoy the infrastructure that... Uh, yeah, yeah, previous speaker spoke about. All right, uh, uh, Bishop. Yeah, so when you talk about this healing, where do we start from? I mean, reading your book, Witness to Justice, uh, and some of the things that you have highlighted and documented in the book gives an understanding of some sections of our history on our, on our past not so far. Where do we start this healing from? Is it something that the present government can begin, and how can he start it? Well, first, I have published two other books after Witness to Justice, 
Um, and they all speak to some of the issues about why national cohesion is so important. Um, and it's not a question of where to start. It is really a question of even developing the will to start. Because if we develop the will to start, then we can begin to map out strategies. It's not something that government can do. Uh, and the government, of course, always likes to say that government cannot do everything. It is the case. Um, because if we map out where we really want to go, then we can assign roles and responsibilities to individuals, to families, and to communities. But there has to be a program of believability. There has to be evidence that the government tells us very clearly where it wants to go, how it hopes to get there, and how we fit into all of this. But we need to, first of all, accept the, the brokenness of our society, and that this brokenness is the result of our own handiwork. We are not under occupation. We are not in a, in, a, in, in a war with anybody. The British have since left. And uh, a lot of the mess that we now find ourselves is, is a mess that was created by us. So I think the first thing is to have the humility and the introspection to say, yes, you know, we can't go on like this. This is not the way that this country was meant to be. Mistakes have been made. We are not even concerned about who made the mistakes, but that mistakes have been made. And that politics can... can provide a platform for helping with this healing. Um, and this is why, uh, like I said in my message, we need to see a much more robust program designed by government to help us go away from just lining up and collecting palliative so-called when we are not in a war. I think it is uh, the height of indignity to see Nigerians lining up every day under the sun and waiting to collect bags of rice, which probably never come. Not because money has not been given, but because everybody who gives out money in Nigeria from the federal government, we know that a good part of this money is always stolen. And Nigerians are not looking for, for handouts. People, ordinary farmers just want to go back to their farms. People just want to be able to get on with their lives. And this is why ending insecurity is the beginning of this healing. And a decisive program and plan for ending mm. insecurity within a timeline will be the beginning of this healing. Yeah, you talked about rejigging of uh, the architecture, the security architecture in Nigeria. But you have a perspective on that. How do you think we can go with that? Because you say that, first and foremost, instead of handing out these and that, let's first and foremost, since we're not in a state of war, let's first of all make the farms and our society secure. When the government says they are rejigging architecture, what comes to mind and how do you think we can better tackle that kind of uh, situation? I'm not the commander-in-chief of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Uh, I'm also not the chief of army staff or the chief of defense staff. But on a more serious note, you know, what is very disheartening, I speak to, you know, people across the board. And I speak to people in the security agencies. I speak to policemen, I speak to the military, I speak to young people in the middle. And every all we hear consistently and persistently is that young military officers are convinced that they can wipe out this nonsense called banditry and insecurity. But there is a feeling that at the top, there is no political will. I believe that the Nigerian military is pretty well equipped the challenge we should ask, and the question we should ask ourselves, is how and why is it that fighting insecurity has become so instrumentalized um, to the point that it is looking as if ending insecurity is not something that there is a lot of enthusiasm about because it has become a meal ticket for quite a, a significant number of, of people across the board. And I think that the president has the, the opportunity uh, that whatever it is that he dreams of doing, and I think that they have wonderful ideas, but it is important. And I don't think the president needs me to say this, but I think it needs to be said that without a secured nation, without a return of a certain level of feeling of dignity and a sense of belonging, as we said in our constitution, all the dreams that we may have about our roads and so on and so forth will come to nothing. So Nigerians need to have a country that they can believe in. Um, and as I said, I believe the infrastructure conversation is very, very important, very, very significant. And I can correlate the absence of infrastructure with the persistence of insecurity. 
Because all you need to do is to also say that if we have this world, the kind of roles that the Minister of Works is talking about, then of course you're not going to have all this uh, breed of human beings that are coming out of the middle of hell, you know, stopping people on the highway, you know, to do the things that they are doing. But I think there needs to be a pretty well-crafted message that tells us that this insecurity is going to end, and there is a timeline for that. Mm -hmm. They're not going to solve the problem by diluting the Nigerian military by bringing in hunters and vigilantes. And all. this is this is this doesn't do justice to the professionalism of the Nigerian army. Uh, Bishop, you, 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 I mean, this, these are very deep uh, stuff. And I'm wondering, just maybe, we saw what happened in South Africa in the post-apartheid era. And maybe, just maybe, the, how many hours, the three or the four hours uh, may come into function. Whether or not you talked about national integration in your message. Uh, just maybe, there might be a national reconciliation such that people will come to the table, agree for things, like you say, Nigerians will walk out of the room knowing full well that they've laid all this burden off their chest. Is that the kind of situation you're proposing? Absolutely. I mean, the idea of, a, of, a, of, a, of an Okuta panel um, is a huge mistake. Nigeria, actually, the federal government does not need to gather people again in a room. We do not need the injuries are very clear. The scars are on our faces. The wounds are everywhere. You can see them. And like somebody said, even a blind man can tell when it is raining. So we don't need to have any combat. Most of the documents in the Puta panel laid the foundation for the things we're talking about. This, the so-called 2014 political reform, I mean, um, a political conference, taken together with what we did in, in 2005, um, 2004, um, there's enough documentation. And frankly, as far as I'm concerned, a government that is really serious, all it needs to do is to set up a small team of political scientists, economists, and people to just sit down and did some of those documentation and provide the country with a roadmap as to where to go. So you don't need to call... I mean, people exaggerate and over-dramatize what happened at, at, uh, at, you know, in South Africa. I visited South Africa myself. I had meetings with, with, uh, with, with you know, with, with Archbishop Tutu. I went to the, you know, I, I've traveled around Asia. I've visited and talked about truth commissions everywhere in the world. They never really meant to, full, to, to, to solve the problems that we always think. Everywhere you've had any of these conversations, the problem has always been that governments have never had to, never been able to develop the political will to carry through, you know, with the things that need to be done. So, but there are a lot of the ingredients. Everything is already, you know, pretty well laid out. It's just a question of how and where government wants to look. If there is enough material. You don't need to call a confab. You don't need to call people in the room. All you need to do, the documents are there. You can dust them up. And there is enough material for charting a way forward across the board for this country beyond the point view of politics. Yeah. I'm being, they're speaking to me, my yes, now from the control room. Uh, I just have uh, 60 seconds to go. But I have uh, two uh, tier uh, questions for you, sir. Uh, one being that you talked about the minority question in Nigeria. That's a major one. And uh, even some majority feels like a minority in the equation. How do we resolve that too? Is it in line with what you said? Well, you know, I mean, minority is, uh, is merely, I don't know, when we talk about minorities, Nigerians like to talk about minorities in terms of numbers. But, you know, in an unjust and in an unfair country such as Nigeria is, there has to be a mechanism for making sure that people are included, even when they didn't register to be included. By being a citizen of Nigeria, the fact that I'm a Christian, the fact that I'm a Muslim, the fact that I'm illiterate, the fact that I'm a man, the fact that I'm a woman, nothing should foreclose the possibility of me enjoying the opportunities that this great country has given to us. And what we have in Nigeria is that people have instrumentalized all kinds of identity. Some have instrumentalized religion as a tool of, of oppression and exclusion. Some have, made, you know, uh, we, you know, they weaponized gender as a tool of oppression and exclusion. So it, the real essence of democracy is to dismantle all these institutions and structures of oppression that have worked for a few. I mean, if you take a place like northern Nigeria, a lot has been said. Not very little needs to be added. Don't, the Northerners have ruled this country more than any other people. 
if, if, if you want to use that category. And if you want to say Muslims have governed this country more than any other, you can use that category. But how do you explain the fact that on almost every index of human survival, you know, northern Nigeria is still embarrassingly coming last? How do you explain the fact that geographically, geopolitically, you know, the whole scene of the crime of, of banditry and kidnapping and all that is rotten and evil and inhuman is taking place within the, you know, the confines of northern Nigeria? This calls for, for, for northerners to speak to themselves. But of course, it also speaks to those who are, you know, who hold the reins of power. But for me as a Christian, I shouldn't be here in northern Nigeria feeling that because I'm worshiping a religion that is different, therefore there are rights that, are, that shouldn't come to me, so simply because of religion. Or you go somewhere else, you know, that Muslims are not necessarily in the majority. To be a minority simply means to be out of the loop of power and loop of, you know, right. the loop of opportunity. Yeah. But, but Bishop, as we go now, just in 20 seconds, this government is just about nine to 10 months old in office. But as young as it is in office, what we want as a nation is for us to get it right. We cannot have a government that is dilly-dallying or trying and, try, trying and uh, you know, trying it here and there. We want a government that will get it right. If there's one thing that is in your mind that you think this government needs to watch and fix, what would that be? Just in 30 seconds so that we can close. Yeah, I don't know about getting it right. I mean, for, first of all, we are dealing with over 200 billion people. It, to get it right, it's not an easy thing to do. But I think we need to, we can see pretty clearly, and I try to make the case in my message. Some people were a little bit disappointed that I wasn't firing on all cylinders. Really, this is not, I'm ready to give this government a chance, you know, because of where we have just come from. Not because of the great things they've done, but when I look back at where we've come from, I will support anybody that can take us away from what where we just came from. So, and I think that my problem with the government is that, and I make the point in my message, there needs to be a robust communication strategy that explains to people what government wants to do. Almost the kind of thing that the minister for for you know for works was saying. And we all, but most important, most important, it is that government needs to end insecurity and end it now because there are uh, allegations of complicity at the highest level. We don't need that. And as long as this cloud is hanging, there will be you know, right. a crisis of credibility. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop uh, Matthew Asen Kuka. Uh, the Right Reverend has been speaking with us tonight. He's a bishop of the Catholic Church, Sokoto Diocese, and is a preacher of conscience. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. I appreciate your your special Thank, you. Thank you so much. And a happy a Easter to you again. Easter. Thank you so much. Happy Easter to you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I'm Shimo Kimbale. Happy Easter, everyone. God bless Nigeria.